Hello and welcome to today's video on um, the question, what do we need to know about plants in key stage three, years seven and eight at school? Uh, I'm going to cover today everything you need to know about them, except for the stuff on plant reproduction, which I'll cover in another video. What's your question? There are no objectives today for you to look at because I'm just going to go through each of those different things and explain them to you. To start with then, the first thing you need to know about is photosynthesis. You need to know about the most important thing that plants do, which is to make their own food using sunlight. We use this word equation and this symbol equation to help us with that. It's carbon dioxide plus water makes glucose and oxygen. Now when you're writing out word and symbol equations like this, it's really important they're written out in this way and that you don't end up putting anything on the right hand side of this underneath anything on the left hand side because their positions in relation to the arrow is really really important. The things on the left are our reactants, they're going to break down and react together uh, and the things on the right are our products, they're going to be formed in this reaction. If you for example are writing in your book and you get to the end of the page and you need to move something lower down you can just put them under the correct side. You shouldn't for example put the thing something like oxygen all the way over under carbon dioxide because it's not correct when we're writing out word equations to do things like that. So just make sure you put them in the right place. I've also given you the symbol equation for this. Uh, carbon dioxide is obviously CO2, water is H2O, glucose is C6H12O6 and oxygen is O2. Um, we can balance this symbol equation uh, but the simplest way to remember this when it comes to photosynthesis is that if it doesn't have a 6 in its formula, you should put a 6 at the front of its formula. So carbon dioxide, water uh, and oxygen don't have 6s in them, so we put a 6 at the front, but glucose does have 6s in it, so we don't put 6s there. I'm going to make a video as well about balancing symbol equations. If you want to see how to balance it properly, you can go and watch that once I've made that video. Where does the plant get each of these things from? It needs carbon dioxide and it needs water. Okay, we know that water is absorbed into a plant through its roots and it travels up the stem through the xylem to get to the leaves where photosynthesis happens inside the cells. We also have carbon dioxide that the plant needs as well and carbon dioxide gets into the plant through the leaves. Uh, we'll talk about the structure of the leaves in a second and exactly where the oxygen, sorry, the carbon dioxide can get in and the oxygen can leave the plant. Now the glucose will be transported around the plant through the phloem cells, the tubes inside them as well, um, along with minerals and other things the plant needs to every cell that requires it. Uh, and the oxygen will be also transported there as well to the cells that need it. And any excess oxygen will leave the plant through the same route that the carbon dioxide gets in. We should also mention here that chlorophyll is required for this process to happen and that can be found inside the leaves of the plant uh, inside the top layer or the third layer down which I'll talk about in a second as well. The chloroplasts contain the chlorophyll uh, and the chlorophyll's job is to absorb sunlight which is the energy required to kickstart this process as the process is endothermic. This diagram shows you the structure of a leaf or the cross-sectional structure of a leaf. That means if I got a leaf and laid it flat and I cut a very thin slice down through the leaf and put that under a microscope I'd see a shape similar to this one. There are several parts of the leaf. I'm going to very quickly go through exactly what each of them does. The top layer we call the waxy cuticle. This is a protective waxy layer that just stops damage to the leaf. Beneath that we have a transparent layer of cells we call the upper epidermis. Uh, we, the epidermis is generally the name we give to those upper cells. The top layer of the skin we can call the epidermis as well. Below that we have the rectangular cells which we call palisade cells. We'll go through exactly what they are and what they do in a second. I'm going to show you a diagram in more detail of those so you can talk about them more. Below those are spongy, is the spongy mesophyll layer filled with spongy cells. Uh, these have some similarities to the palisade cells and you'll notice there is gaps between these cells for air to get into. Uh, specifically the part of the air that we want, uh, the plant will want, is the carbon dioxide and the oxygen. It will need to absorb carbon dioxide to use in photosynthesis and it will give out oxygen uh, or into the air as well, any excess oxygen into those. It will use up some of it and then give out the stuff that it doesn't need. The bottom layer of the leaf is fairly similar to the upper layer, the uh, epidermis. Again, we have the lower epidermis here. You will notice there is a small difference in there is extra cells in here we call the guard cells. 
The guard cells can swell up or shrink in, in by filling up or emptying water to open or close the hole between them if they need to let in or let out oxygen and carbon dioxide. It depends on how much photosynthesis the plant's doing as to whether it will open up or it will stay shut. I've placed here uh, an image of the palisade cells, those rectangular cells. Uh, they have several parts of them that you need to know about, all of them are important. On the outside you'll see the cell wall, this is giving the cell its structure, making it rectangular. Uh, and next to that is the cell membrane, the cell membrane is letting things into and out of the cell. You'll notice the round structure, um, which is the nucleus, the blue, nu it's blue in the diagram, it's not blue in real life. This is the nucleus, it contains the DNA, the instructions for our cell. Uh, the green ovals you can see are the chloroplasts, these contain the chlorophyll which is going to absorb the sunlight and these palisade cells are at the top of the leaf just under those see-through layers of the epidermis and the waxy cuticle and they're there, to, they're there to let the sunlight through and the palisade cells can absorb that sunlight using the chlorophyll in the chloroplasts. There's a vacuole to store waste and excess uh, anything that the cell has. Uh, and there's also going to be cytoplasm between all these different things. The graphs I've placed here give you the information you need to know about when it comes to the limiting factors for photosynthesis. The limiting factors are the things that might make photosynthesis happen more slowly or more quickly. Uh, to make each of these graphs effective, when they got this data, they'll have made sure that when they're testing light, for example, the amount of carbon dioxide and the temperature will not have changed during that time. When they're doing the carbon dioxide test, the amount of light and temperature will have stayed the same. This is to make sure the test is fair uh, and make sure that there are no other things affecting the rate of photosynthesis here as much as possible. So as you can see in the left hand diagram, you can see that the, as the amount of light increases, the rate of photosynthesis increases as well. And this happens because there's more energy, as more light is provided, the plant has more energy, and so that more photosynthesis can happen. The reason why that plateaus, while it flattens out towards the end, is because up to a certain point, um, it, the amount of light will allow it to do the work until there is not enough carbon dioxide for the plant to continue increasing its rate of photosynthesis. Once it runs out of that carbon dioxide, it can't keep going up. If we look at the diagram for carbon dioxide, we get a very similar trend. As the amount of carbon dioxide goes up, the rate continues to increase until we reach a point where there's not enough energy or reactants or other things available for it to continue to increase its rate as well. And finally, the temperature diagram, you can see as the temperature increases, the rate of reaction increases. Now that peak of the graph will be our optimum temperature for the plant when the rate is at its fastest. And after that, the rate of reaction drops very quickly. There is a specific word that comes up that you need to be able to use to make sure you can describe what's happening here because enzymes are what are required to allow this reaction to happen. If those enzymes get too hot, they denature, their shape changes and they no longer do the job they need to. If they denature, none of the enzymes will be able to do their job and none of the photosynthesis will be able to happen, which is why we see the rate of reaction completely drop off and drop down to zero because the enzymes are denatured and this is no longer doing its job. I've placed some questions here for you to think about. Before I go through what the answers are, I'd like you to have a think about what the different minerals are that plants require in order to grow uh, and why we bother using fertilizer. Pause the video here and have a go at them thinking about what the answers might be. Okay, so the four types of mineral our plant needs are phosphates, nitrates, magnesium, and potassium. Uh, and we are going to use fertilizers to provide those four nutrients to a plant. Uh, the main ones of these are the nitrates, phosphates and potassium that you'll hear about. If you go and buy fertilizer it comes with an NPK ratio telling you the amount of those things in it and the amount of those you need depends on what plant it is you're trying to grow. A deficiency of any of these nutrients is very clear in plants that we have. When it comes to nitrates, Plants with a nitrate deficiency do not grow very well and the, as the leaves get older they will turn a yellow colour. When it comes to phosphorus or phosphates, there's not being enough of that, the roots should grow poorly uh, and the younger leaves will have, have a purple colour. Uh, and if there's not enough potassium in a plant, you should have yellow leaves with dead patches on them. I'm putting pictures up here so you can see what they should look like. And finally, if there's a magnesium deficiency, the plants will, leaves will turn yellow uh, as well. 
So if you see any of those issues on a plant that you're trying to grow, then you know that that is the cause. You don't have enough of those specific nutrients in the soil you're trying to grow them in. I hope that was helpful. It's a very quick summary of the main parts you may come across in key stage three um, plants. And if you have any questions about it, please throw them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer those questions for you in another video or in the comments. Thanks very much for watching. Make sure you stay safe, stay alert, stay curious and subscribe.